Well, good morning. I'll say it again. Good morning. It's been a few mornings since I said good morning. It's a, a delight to be back. A delight to be back here uh, in in the pulpit and before the altar and and with all of you, my friends and and neighbors. It's good to see you all here. I'm I'm looking at the two Kotke girls. I think the last time I saw you that far apart was a fast break on the on the basketball court. <laughs> a long pass. <laughs> so it's <laughs> look forward to seeing you that far apart a time or two in the coming basketball season. We very excited to come over and, and see some more of that basketball. I'm sure you've been training and working hard. Good, good. And uh, yeah, and I know everybody else has been busy at it. I. My wife has got treats and everything and coffee and such after services, and so I hope you'll all uh, join us. I set the coffee pot up for her in the kitchen, and I wanted to tell her maybe right after the sharing of the piece to go down and turn it on. So if one of you sees her, tell her she can turn it. You know how to turn the coffee pot on. It's just a button. Or one of you go do it. <laughs> Anyway, one way or the other, we'll get, we'll get coffee. But she's got cinnamon something or others, bacon, and, uh, and it should be wonderful. So please join us after services for that. Uh, you'll also notice we've got our screens running. Uh, this will be sort of the uh, inaugural try for Sunday services. Um, the boys have been working with the gear, and we think we've uh, got it under control. Be trying out some different color schemes today to see what shows best uh, in terms of visibility, you know, maybe white backgrounds with dark letters or the other way around. And so there'll be a, a little of that going on. Oh, and for those of you watching the, the broadcast today, we're still working out some bugs on that, getting the formatting of the picture just right. So it uh, might not be a great picture for you yet while we still go through some technical issues with the broadcast folks uh, outside of the church and, uh, and get that all settled in. But uh, if you're having trouble seeing the screens at all today, you know, you could move up a little closer. There's always that option. The, uh, the ushers would be happy to fi help you find seating nearer to the altar, just saying. Just saying. Anyway, uh, glad to be here and glad to see you with us. So why don't we then move on to our opening hymn, and I'll ask you to stand, and we will sing together God, whose almighty word. Number 400. And now let us compose our hearts and minds for our brief order of confession and forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, 
all desire is known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so now, in a moment of silence, give unto the Lord this day what burdens your hearts. And we pray, most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so now, as a member with you in the priesthood of all believers, but by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer of the day. And we pray... Almighty, eternal God, increase in us your gifts of faith, hope, and love. And in order that love may abide in us, help us to celebrate what your love has done for us. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated, and we'll have our lessons. Good morning. The first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 56. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. The second reading comes from Romans chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. The word of the Lord. Will you all please rise for the reading of the gospel. We read this morning from the Holy Gospel from chapter 15 of the book of Matthew. Jesus went away from Gennesaret and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. 
And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. You. you may be seated. Well, as I said in my opening remarks, it is truly a great joy to my heart to be back with you again for Sunday services. You know, the last seven weeks or so have, well, in some ways gone by really very quickly, but now as I stand here with you, it, it feels like I've been gone a while. I, I realize that I kind of missed you all. While I was on hiatus, Cindy and I did take a, a few days to get away. Once we went into northern Minnesota, Vermilion and uh, Ely area, uh, just to have a little alone time amid the lakes and the pines up there. And then we made a few days down in Dubuque, Iowa for some long overdue reconnection time with some extended family. Mostly though, we were busy getting our house ready to go on the market and getting the last few things in place here so we could move into the parsonage. Well, we did get our house on the market, hoping for a quick sale at a top dollar, but instead we met challenges. I kind of think higher interest rates may have made our price range less accessible to buyers who were looking for affordable monthly payments. But at any rate, it was all very frustrating. Yet the bigger impact was in the unanticipated delay. We accepted an offer in late July rather than a hoped-for early June. And we hoped by now that we would have had our household all set up and cozy and that on this first Sunday back I'd be able to announce to you that we were going to have an open house and have you all drop in and see what we'd done with the place. But instead, as of today, we've been under the roof over here about a week and while we have a bedroom, a bathroom, and the kitchen mostly set up, the rest of the house and garage are still rather a maze of boxes and bags and various things that haven't quite found their place yet. We haven't moved everything out of our Hutchinson house yet either, and our closing day is just 10 days off. Oh, but listen to me whine thinking I've got worries and woes. When this community, in the midst of remembering, commemorating, the 20-year anniversary of a devastating tornado is suddenly ravaged again by a hailstorm of, of proportions, my God, we rarely see anywhere. And I'm sure that when all claims are totaled up and all repairs are made, Oh, it's going to be many millions of dollars again that have been lost. But I wonder if in all of that, the material losses are worse than the fear so many of you must have felt. Oh, it must have been horrifying. Baseball-sized hailstones shattering your windows, hammering your roofs, battering your cars, and those of your neighbors and all around you. Or, good heavens, the sinking feeling some of you must have felt when you finally got out to be able to survey the damage in your fields. I mean, <laughs> driving the, the roads between here and Hutch, I've seen a lot of, a lot of damage. I, I drove some of the, country, uh, the, the county roads east of Oakdale Golf Course 
a week ago Saturday, and I looked at, well, I looked at what I knew to be cornfields, but the vegetation, I'll use that word here, in them, I mean, it, it didn't even look like corn anymore. It had been so utterly, utterly destroyed. My gosh, it broke my heart to see that. I can't imagine how it must have felt for the families who planted it. And so we come to church on this Sunday morning and we, well, we hope to hear words of comfort. Maybe some answers to our questions of why such things happen to good people. But then we get a set of lessons that don't seem to impart even much clarity, let alone comfort. Where's the good news? Where's the gospel today? Well, now, the, the reading from Isaiah doesn't start out too badly. We know Isaiah is speaking to the Israelites, but talking to them about foreigners. And we can put two and two together here and understand that that means us. And it sounds pretty plain that Isaiah is saying that the Lord God means for his blessings to be for foreigners, for us, as well as his chosen people of Israel. Well, this is good news. In the Old Testament, according to the prophet Isaiah, by golly, we hear the gospel. But then we move into the reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, and this message of Paul's seems to bring clouds into Isaiah's blue sky. Now, once again, to be fair to Paul, our lectionary editors are bringing us in again in the middle of the story. I mean, the first words we hear from Paul, he's saying, no, God hasn't rejected his chosen people. I'm an Israelite myself, and I don't feel rejected. Well, we kind of tap the brakes at that, don't we? And we think, well, well, well now wait, now, what, what, was that even in question? What was Paul talking about just before this? Well, we don't get that resolved. Paul just charges forward, telling the Romans that part of his purpose in being an apostle to Gentiles is to try to make his Jewish brethren jealous. So that in what? In jealousy, those Jews might come to faith in Christ Jesus? Can faith come from jealousy? And we don't get that resolved either. But Paul says two more things that are worth a mention. And the cloudier statement really is the last phrase in the lesson. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Kind of sounds like Paul is saying that God has made everyone disobedient so that he can be merciful to all. That God makes us bad only so that he can save us. Does he mean to say that we're just a make-work project for the Almighty? This is really tough stuff to work out. Very tough to accept. And in fact, as it turns out, this is one of the very toughest points of faith and the one that I and all kinds of preachers like me will labor all of our careers to try to help people to grasp. I won't get you all there in one sermon. But then the other thing Paul says to us today is a key. He says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable irrevocable now that verse is so surrounded by confusion it is almost lost in the lesson but it's the one most plain thing Paul says because this verse says exactly what it means how God calls us and how he has gifted us for all our lives and all of eternity will never ever be taken back 
by God. For all of the tough situations we will ever find ourselves in, in this unpredictable, hurt-filled world, no matter our frustrations at things not going for us as we plan or hope for, no matter the fears we feel in horrifying moments or the despair of desolated hope or in the doubt at wondering what God is doing to us now, God's call endures. God's gifts remain. God's love is steadfast and overcomes all. But now, and finally, what do we do with this story of the Canaanite woman? She comes to our loving Jesus Lord and to beg his help, and he gives her the cold shoulder. And as he is pressed to do something for this woman, he even seems to resort to insult. How is this enduring and steadfast love? Well, there's a lot going on in subtext here. But also, some higher level perspective is needed. First, this is a gospel lesson. It is, in this case, Matthew's telling of the history of the ministry of Jesus. And now none of the Gospels, none of them represent that these histories are the tellings of chance moves, chance actions, unpredicted encounters. In fact, rather to the contrary, all four Gospels tell us that God sent his Son into a sin-filled world out of his steadfast love and for a purpose. Jesus didn't turn a random corner and bump into a Canaanite woman by accident. So, now a quick look into subtext. The Canaanites were pagans. Pagans. Non-believers in God. Nor even in God's for that matter, and by that I, I refer to like the Greek and the Roman uh, gods of mythology, Zeus and Poseidon and so forth. So this is, for Matthew's Jewish readers, an unmistakable example of someone, a good Jewish boy like Jesus, should not be even speaking to. Well, she addresses him with a language of faith then. Have mercy on me, O Lord, Son of David. How does that come out of a pagan mouth? Jesus ignores her, but she persists with her crying out. And it finally gets to the disciples, and they ask Jesus to do something. Now, our text translates their words as, send her away, for she is crying out after us. But actually, in the Greek, in which Matthew wrote, the sense is more that they are asking him to just give her what she wants, shut her up, and send her away. What he says back to them, though, is quite pointed and sounds quite exclusionary, but he does not give his guys what they want either. Our Lord is after something here, something else, something different. She comes before him and prays this time, well, with basically the same prayer that Peter used when he tried to walk on water to meet Jesus and started to sink. Remember that story? And he, as he's sinking down like a rock, he says, Lord, help me! And that's her prayer here too. Well, now Jesus at last addresses her, but with something of an insult, more or less calling her, or at least comparing her to a dog. But she takes that insult, in fact, embraces it. 
Her situation is so desperate that she has turned away from shame. She can't afford it. She's turned away from all she ever knew before. Turned away from fear and disbelief and on her knees at last. And she makes a confession. A declaration of true faith. A faith like we must have. A faith that is not conditional on things like being given the timing we want on selling our house or on never bringing onto us anything to fear or to be broken hearted about. A faith that doesn't make prior demands of God before any sign of it will be shown. She tells him she believes that the abundance of the Lord God's blessings are greater than all worldly things and that even of their crumbs is blessing beyond all measure. (laughs) Jesus hasn't been pushing her away. By no means! He has been drawing her in. He's been teeing it up for her. So she, she, even a pagan woman, can proclaim the good news that he has been sent to be for all people. And as Jesus, the Lord and Messiah, confers upon her, His miracle of healing, he confirms that indeed God's love and his blessings and his salvation are irrevocably for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will uh, sing our hymn of the day, Lord Whose Love in Humble Service.
Okay, I will ask you now to stand. And I'm going to just throw a wrench in the whole works. And this is what we're going to be doing, uh, I think, uh, from now on. Just a slight change in order of service. And we'll get the bulletins right, uh, you know, in, in the weeks to come. But uh, after long deliberation, it seems to me that since I like to come down here and do the Apostles' Creed with you, whilst I'm down here, then let's go right into the sharing of peace. Then I'll go up, we'll do the offerings while that happens, and then we'll do all the prayers and praying and such like. It just seems like it's a little more efficient flow. So that's what we're going to do. So we will do Apostles' Creed, and then we'll go right into sharing of the peace, and I'll pull the prayers of the church out, and we'll do that right after the offering stuff. So we'll just stand here next to the basketball player, and, uh, and let us proclaim together the words of the Apostles' Creed. And we declare, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us share with one another a sign of God's peace. God's peace. Thanks for reading. God's peace.
Lord, we thank you for the many gifts you have given us. Teach us to use them in charity and compassion, in stewardship and service to others. Through your Holy Spirit, give us awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may praise you on our lips and in our lives, that we may give ourselves to your service, that we may walk in your ways, holy, and by the righteousness of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's compose our hearts then for prayers of the church. Holy God, you are the source of our strength in this life. Grant us strength in the face of trials and help us to fully rely on you as we struggle through the storms of life. Give us courage to let go of that which we cannot control and trust that you have our better interest in mind always because of your great love for us. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we ask that you would watch over those who serve in the armed forces or who serve as peace officers in our community. Protect them and bring them home safely to their families. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the bride of Christ, dear Lord, the holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Empower us to follow Jesus with our whole lives and to make disciples of all nations, that your name may be praised and honored in all the earth. Be with church leaders and help them lead with integrity and faith, trusting in the Holy Spirit to guide them. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, be with all those who are sick or injured and are in hospital or recuperating at home. Bring strength to their weary bodies, hope to their hearts and minds. We pray for those who are aging and are bound to their homes. Provide good friends to visit with them and loved ones to care for them. And we remember all those who are facing health concerns this day, especially Dee Dee and Ricky and Tom, Ken and Roger, Stephen and Alan, and those in care centers like Zelda and Mary Ann, Ruth and Warren and Mabel. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to Almighty God our Lord. It was on the very night in which he was betrayed that our Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take all of you and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper, he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take all of you and drink, for this is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it, for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together now the words our Savior taught us. Our... Or we will sing.
All present who call upon the name of Lord Jesus are welcome now at the Lord's table. Children, if any, uh, that have not yet begun to commune may be brought forward for a blessing. We'll uh, commune the helpers and then ushers will, uh, will uh, cue you as we normally do. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. Send us forth from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We will sing our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. First three verses.
Now go in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Don't forget coffee and donuts.